Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode 3 of 5 in our series on mosquitoes this week. You would think that this would be like a tiny little topic, and yes, the subject is tiny, but the amount of information is huge because this is one of those insects that has this intertwined history with us. So far we've talked about some of that history, we've talked about how they work, why they like our blood, and not everybody's blood. Uh, that's what we talked about yesterday, so make sure you go back and watch yesterday and the day before's episode about the history. Today we're going to talk about the diseases mosquitoes carry and why they have such an intertwined history, like what these diseases can do to us. Uh, tomorrow and the next day we're going to talk about how we fight these mosquitoes and whether or not we should just kill them all, because maybe we should, but we'll get there. For some of us, mosquitoes are just annoying, you know, they bite us, we itch, you know, you get a little uncomfortable for a few days, maybe put some calamine lotion on there, that's what my mom used to do. Uh, the itch goes away, you forget about it. but. There is a deathly part of this cycle that we often don't think about, you know? The fact that the mosquito is breaking the skin, that's our major barrier to disease, is our skin. It's the biggest organ in our body, and it's there to keep pathogens out of us. And mosquitoes just go right around it, stick right into our bloodstream. Most people are aware that mosquitoes can carry diseases, and they're pretty good at transmitting some of those diseases into our bodies. Viruses like malaria, dengue fever, West Nile, Zika, and we're gonna look at each of these in turn and explain what they are and, and why mosquitoes carry them. So first off, there's malaria. It's a huge killer worldwide. It's existed for over 4,000 years, and it may not seem like it, but there are actually two types of malaria. There's uncomplicated malaria, which has three different stages. It's a, a cold, and then a hot, and a sweating. You can experience weakness and an enlarged spleen and mild jaundice and enlargement of the liver. That's, that's the uncomplicated version. Then there's severe malaria. This is when infections are then complicated by organ failure, abnormalities in your blood or your metabolism. So it's like the malaria just makes it worse and then you would get abnormal behavior and your consciousness would be impaired. You could potentially have seizures or go into a coma and it can be life-threatening. But this all depends on the host's genes. So uncomplicated malaria, which has those three stages, you can have that and be okay, but if you have the wrong genetic markers, you could potentially get severe malaria and it can cause all sorts of other problems. Malaria is not the mosquito itself. It's carried by the mosquito. It's a parasite, a plasmodium. It's transferred specifically by the Anopheles mosquito and specifically in the Anopheles group, it's carried only by the females. The female Anopheles mosquito makes a blood meal and it does that to carry out the production of the mosquito eggs. It's part of their reproductive cycle. So the blood meal is the link between the human and the mosquito hosts because once that mosquito pokes into your skin, the malaria parasite can get right into your bloodstream and spread throughout your body. Because the bloodstream goes everywhere and eventually hits the liver, the malaria just sits in your blood, waits to get to the liver where it then attacks. It feasts, it multiplies, targets red blood cells, and vital organs across the whole body begin to suffer because of that. There used to be a vaccine for malaria, you've probably heard of it. The remedy uh, was known as quinine, and it comes from the bark of a chinchona tree. Then in the 1940s, a synthetic drug was created using something called chloroquine, or chlorokine, I'm not sure. An insecticide, DDT, was then developed. You've probably heard of DDT, it's a fairly famous insecticide, and that eradicated the malaria disease because it killed the mosquitoes. But in the 1970s, DDT was knocked back because it was thought that it was harmful to certain wildlife. And because of that, mosquitoes became resistant to it, and that was the end of that. So now malaria is still rampaging around the world and something that people are still working on trying to cure. Dengue fever was recorded as early as 265 or about 420 BCE or AD. Like malaria, there are also two types of dengue fever. There's the less severe kind and the more severe kind. And the less severe kind, you're gonna experience flu-like symptoms. You're gonna get a high fever and a headache. You're gonna have joint aches and pains. It feels very much like the flu, like a really bad flu. But if you get a severe dengue fever, 
there will be leakage of blood plasma out of your capillaries. You'll have a reduced white blood cell count, which makes it so you can experience other diseases. You can also bruise more easily because you can't repair yourself. Uh, and it's transmitted by a specific mosquito called the Aedes mosquito. A-E-D-E-S, not, you know, the decade. In most countries, there isn't an approved vaccine for the Aedes mosquito transmitted dengue fever. But in 2015, a French pharmaceutical company, Sanofi, developed a vaccine they called Dengvaxia, and it was approved in Brazil, the Philippines, and Mexico. And it's essentially a live virus comprised of an attenuated yellow fever virus, which is genetically engineered to coax the immune system to create the right antibodies. So if you do become exposed to dengue, you're already prepared. It sounds dangerous which is maybe why it hasn't been approved everywhere. I don't actually know that much about it. If you're not in those three countries, uh, and I am not, there is no specific medication that you can take to treat dengue. Most people who have good medical care could recover from both types of dengue fever. And, you know, you need hydration, you need fluid replacement, pain relievers, and of course, bed rest. All of those things are available in most uh, good hospitals and medical facilities. The problem comes when it strikes somewhere that doesn't have those medical facilities, and then you don't get rehydrated easily. You don't get bed rest. You aren't ready for this to hit. There's also West Nile, another virus that is here in the U.S. And now uh, dengue and malaria, you, you have that in the U.S., but the chances of being infected here are not nearly as high as other places around the world. You're more likely to be infected if you travel, but that doesn't mean we're safe, right? Because West Nile was first detected in North America in 1999, and most people have no symptoms when they're bit by a mosquito that is carrying West Nile. But one in five experience fever with symptoms like headaches and body aches and joint pains and vomiting and diarrhea and a rash. So it's like a flu, but you know, way worse. The virus can cross the blood-brain barrier, which is also terrible. Uh, you can watch a DNews video about that if you want to know more about the blood-brain barrier specifically. Um, and it can even affect the spinal cord and the brain. This has happened to less than 1% of the people who have been infected with West Nile, but it can lead to, because it's the brain, serious neurological problems like encephalitis or meningitis. And people who have their brain and spinal column affected by West Nile can experience coma, tremors, seizures, paralysis, or just simple disorientation. And some of that may be permanent and other bits might be deadly. About 10% who develop neurological symptoms after experiencing West Nile will die. And there's no cure. Symptoms can be treated, but there's no cure for this. And now the new kid on the block, or you know, and the new kid on the media block really, is Zika. And you've likely heard about Zika because the World Health Organization recently declared Zika a public health emergency of international concern, a P-H-E-I-C. And this led to some controversial discussions in Brazil, especially for women, uh, specifically mothers and their children, and abortion rights. Because Zika, is suspected to be linked to an incurable neurological birth defect called microcephaly. And it's a, essentially a atrophying of parts of the body. The birth defect creates a small head that can lead to brain damage. Uh, also Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an immune system that attacks the nervous system of the person. This is terrible. And Zika, I said new kid on the block via the media because it's actually existed since 1947 but there were just a few documented cases in Southeast Asia and Africa. And it was thought that the virus was brought to Brazil because of the World Cup in 2014. Someone traveled from somewhere where Zika was more common and they brought it with them to Brazil. Outside of possible birth defects, Zika is rarely fatal. You get you know, a little milder symptoms than with dengue fever. Uh, most don't experience symptoms at all, which is dangerous because if you don't know that you have it and then you try and produce a child, you could have a child with one of those disorders. And unlike many other viruses that we've talked about today so far, Zika can be transmitted sexually, say some studies, and that makes it hard to know who's at risk because it could be given to a man and then passed to a woman and thus the birth defects could occur. The question that we have after these kind of heavy bits of this episode is, 
why is it that these diseases are the ones that mosquitoes tend to carry? These tend to be, you know, pretty terrible, life-threatening diseases. Why not something else? I mean, another life-threatening disease that is blood-borne and also sexually transmitted is HIV. So why don't mosquitoes carry HIV? They don't because of the way the mosquito works. Their snout looks like a needle, but it's actually uh, comprised of six different mouth parts if you get really, really close to it, maybe with an electron microscope. And those mouth parts are used to pierce the skin. Then inside of those mouth parts, there are various tubes, and one sends saliva into the host, and the other sends blood up to the mosquito. Blood from the mosquito never actually goes into the host, just the saliva. So if a mosquito does suck up some of the blood from you and get the HIV virus, the mosquito would have it, but it wouldn't pass it through its saliva back into you. The thing is, mosquitoes, separately from that, aren't really susceptible to HIV because they don't have T cells the way we do. And HIV attacks the T cells and they need those T cells in order to replicate. So without them, the virus just kind of gets broken down inside the mosquito's body. When it comes to these diseases though, you know, West Nile, dengue, Zika, malaria, these are huge problems, especially in the developing world. And there are organizations all over the planet dedicated to either one or all of these infections, of these diseases, and in fighting these things. Prevention techniques for these infections are largely about staying away from mosquitoes. You know, what else can you really do? You can wear long pants, you can wear long sleeve clothing, you can get mosquito nets and repellents and stay in places with air conditioning and keep stagnant water at bay. But there may be other things that we can do too. We're gonna to talk about that in the next episode. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that. Let us know down in the comments uh, if you know of any other mosquito-borne pathogens that are pretty terrible. These are some of the big ones, but there are a lot more out there. And, you know, may as well raise awareness while we're all talking about it. Thanks for watching D News Plus, everybody. I'm Trace. Come find me on Twitter if you want to talk about mosquitoes or anything else. I'm out there all the time. Thanks for watching.